Okay, thank you, Hans. Uh, thank you to everyone who is uh, following this. I see that we are 59 people now, so thanks for your interest. And also, of course, thank you to Leonardo Energy for allowing me to present this uh, topic. Uh, before we start, uh, let me warn the people who are already familiar somewhat with the topic that I chose to start the presentation from the basics. Uh, I think it is important to have the basic concepts right in order to avoid uh, misunderstandings in further discussions. So I'm excited to start. Let's go to the presentation. First of all, let's think about uh, what it is to supply electricity. We know it's very complicated, but the basics are quite simple. Uh, you find a production facility, let's say uh, a coal-fired electricity plant on the left of the slide. You connect it to the grid, and then the grid will pass on the production of the coal plant to the consumer. In this case, I chose a factory to symbolize the consumer because we are talking here about corporate consumers first and foremost. So basically, uh, an electricity supplier is just acting, and I don't want to be disrespectful, it is a complicated business, but it's just acting as a link between the producer of electricity and the consumer. So that's a quite basic, simple fact. Now let's add some complexity by adding another production facility. So no, we, now we no longer have just a coal plant, we also have a wind turbine connected to the grid, and suddenly things get a little more complicated and we find the first very important concept that we need to think about during this whole uh, webinar, and that's the concept of the fuel mix. So as we've seen in the, in the drawing, the consumer now is suddenly getting a mix of different types of electricity, and because everybody understands that there is a difference between coal-generated electricity and, for instance, wind turbine-generated electricity, but once the electricity is on the grid, and this is really fundamental in this context, once the electricity is on the grid, it cannot be distinguished, it has no smell, it has no color, you cannot tell it apart uh, even if it comes from different sources. So this is something very specific about electricity. It is impossible to label it. It is impossible to package green electricity or whatever source of electricity separately. So this is a fundamental concept we have to keep in mind for the rest of the explanation. Now, if you go back to our drawings, we add another layer of complexity by adding a second consumer. And this time, it's a household consumer, as you can see. So now we are for a very specific situation. Imagine that, well, first, at first sight, not much has changed because there is still a grid. There is still a mix of electricity on the grid, and the consumers are being supplied by the grid. But what gets complicated if you ask the question, how to make green electricity reliable? Because imagine that we have a supplier which is not so very honest, and that both of the consumers on the right of the picture are asking the supplier for the electricity from the wind turbine. Imagine that the supplier, which is, as I've said, not very honest, just says to the both of the consumers, yes, yes, it is you who is getting the electricity from the wind turbine. Clearly, this is a claim that has to be questioned and which it cannot be seen as a reliable claim. Okay, I think this is the basic question we are struggling with for the moment, but first of all, let me just explain why I am telling you this story. I'm not here to sell anything, I'm not an electricity supplier, I'm not even the guy who is producing the electricity, but AIB, the organization I represent, is focused on the key element in the answer to the question, how do we make green electricity reliable? And that is the instrument of the guarantee of origin. AIB, Association of Issuing Bodies, is an international not-for-profit organization, and we currently have members in 20 countries, and we hope to get some more 
quite soon. The goal of the EIB is to make Europe work together around this instrument, the guarantee of origin. Okay, so let's go back to our drawings and find a solution to the question. The, how do we make green electricity contracts reliable? We use a parallel system because, as I've said, you cannot track the electricity from the wind turbine, which is what, what we want to do because we are interested in the green character. Um, but in order to prove that a green contract for electricity is reliable, you cannot label the electricity from the wind turbine on the grid, so we need to label it in a parallel system, and that is the guarantee of origin. So the issuing body, hence the name Association of Issuing Bodies, is the organ, the, the, the organization, which is given the responsibility by a, a certain country, member state, to issue the guarantees of origin. And each time one megawatt hour of electricity is produced by the wind turbine, a guarantee of origin will be issued, which represents the green character or the green nature of that one megawatt hour production by the wind turbine. And this guarantee of origin uh, is brought to a consumer. In this case, it is the household consumer, but it could just as well be the corporate consumer, which is getting the guarantee of origin and which can claim to have used the electricity from the wind turbine. In economics terms, this system is called a book and claim system because it is sort of a bookkeeping accounting system which is keeping up with the production of the wind turbine or with, with different um, production facilities based on renewable electricity. And therefore, uh, these uh, proof of, of one megawatt hour of electricity, which is the guarantee of origin, is then claimed by a consumer and is taken off uh, the accountings or is redeemed, as we call it. That's basically it, but as you feel, it is quite complicated. So let's go into more detail. Let's, let's have a look at the AIB. As you can see, we have quite a lot of countries of the European Union and some non-EU countries like Norway, Switzerland, and Iceland. And we have several countries which are now looking at joining the AIB because they are either a formal applicant or an active observer. So uh, that's why I said that we hope to add some more members to the organization quite soon. What does AIB do? Um, we have taken this instrument of the guarantee of origin and we have tried to add uh, added value to that by creating a de facto standard called the European Energy Certificate System. And every issuing body which joins the AIB commits itself to following that standard of operation. We also operate a hub for trading the guarantees of origin and therefore we can say that we play a vital role in the market for geos and in providing disclosure information to consumers. We'll come back to that uh, in a couple of slides. We've taken over the operational tasks of the REDIS project by publishing the residual mix calculations and the country profiles. We do reviews to make our system uh, reliable. We are involved in the European fraud prevention activities with, uh, with NSOE and others. And we have issued policy guidance in the context of the clean energy package just to give you an overview of some of the things we do in AIB. Now, some words about the framework in which this guarantee of origin uh, is situated or should be situated. There are actually currently three European directives which are important in this context. The first one, the Internal Markets Directive, uh, doesn't speak about GEOs as such, but um, is actually the one which is defining how uh, and why the geos are being used. And that's, as I've said, because of energy source disclosure. If you look at your bill 
at your electricity bill, you will find there a some sort of information, some sort of statistic, which explains what uh, fuel mix, what mix of electricity sources you were getting from your supplier. This information is based, as far as renewable electricity is concerned, uh, on the geo. And then there are the two directives which have created the geo. There's the res directive, which of course creates the geos which are used for approving the origin of electricity from renewable sources. And there is the a bit less known energy efficiency directive, which um, created the geos for high efficiency cogeneration, electricity coming from high efficiency cogeneration plants. Now, this is a market um, which is much less developed than the rest geo market. Uh, so for the rest of the presentation, we will be focusing on the rest geos. But the same principles pretty much apply for the high efficiency cogeneration geos. Now, if you look at this legal framework, the guarantee of origin is defined as a unique tradable and transferable electronic document or proof that is used for only one thing, that is to prove to the final consumer that a given share of electricity or energy was produced from a renewable sources or from high efficiency cogeneration. And as I said, the unit is one megawatt hour. So if you want as a consumer to claim that you have used one megawatt hour of electricity from renewable sources, you need to cancel the geo which represents that uh, consumption and you need to cancel it in the registry of the issuing body of the country of consumption. By doing this and by applying the EECS rules, the energy, uh, European Energy Certificate System rules, we prevent that there is any possibility of double counting and so that no one megawatt hour of renewable electricity can be sold or claimed by a consumer uh, twice, thus making the system reliable. So as I've said, the GEOs are there to prove to final consumers that they have consumed uh, a certain amount of electricity coming from renewable sources. This is called disclosure information. And so there, the purpose of the guarantee of origin, and this is often a very big misunderstanding in policy discussions, even now with the clean energy package, we hear this all the time. They say, well, are they not for support? Are they not for stimulating new investment in renewable production capacity? No, they are not explicitly um, aimed at supporting the production of renewable electricity or they are not explicitly um, meant for stimulating new investment in renewable capacity. So I see the GEO as an instrument for consumer empowerment and not an instrument for direct investment stimulation. That's clearly what comes out of the text of the European legal framework. It's also very important to see that the GEOs, guarantees of origin, are time-stamped, and if they are not used, they will expire. So they will be just end their lifetime or their usable lifetime, and then they will end up in the residual mix calculations, and they will still be visible as green in that residual mix calculation, but they will not be claimed or they cannot no longer be claimed by a single consumer, which is actually the, the reason why they are there. So from this explanation, it's clear that disclosure on the one hand, the information on your bill about where your electricity comes from and guarantees of origin are actually two sides of the same coin. The GO is proof of one megawatt hour of production with renewable sources and what you find on your bill, the disclosure information is what you have consumed. And there is a clear link. It is sort of the beginning and the end of one single chain 
uh, process chain. So if we think about the policy perspective, then they, we need to look at guarantees of origin and disclosure information as one process that looks, must looks at in a complete way. Currently, the disclosure information is always on an, on an annual basis. So what you find on your bill is actually what you have used or consumed as electricity in the previous year. There is some discussion going on in the clean energy package about the lifespan of the geo, but for now, let's keep in mind that disclosure is about the electricity you used last year. Okay, so why would a consumer be bothered with guarantees of origin? I think there are many, many reasons you can think of, and there are even some who are not on the slide. Uh, if you look at it from a corporate perspective, you see that many corporate consumers are doing, uh, are using guarantees of origin for their corporate social responsibility. They have to re write reports on the fact that they are trying to um, be more sustainable, for instance. There's carbon footprinting, uh, the greenhouse gas protocol. There's environmental footprinting of products in which more and more, you also look at the electricity or the energy in general, which is being used for production of the products. And if you use green electricity, then you have an advantage in terms of environmental footprint of your products. There is simply the fact that they want to say, we buy green electricity, so procurement. There's climate leadership. There are all kinds of initiatives like uh, science-based targets initiative. There's the greenhouse gas protocol, which looks at the uh, electricity you buy when you look at scope two emissions. There are initiatives like the WE100 or WE Mean Business, which try to or succeed, uh, luckily, in uh, getting big multinational companies to commit to a 100% renewable uh, electricity uh, strategy. And there are power purchasing agreements. I see that some people have already mentioned that they are very much interested in power purchasing agreements or PPAs, uh, looking at the introductions in the um, left uh, column uh, of our webinar software. So many, many reasons why corporate consumers are uh, involved with guarantees of origin and also in several countries. Uh, there are also household consumers which are uh, which have a green electricity contract and therefore which uh, use, maybe without knowing it or without realizing it in an active way, but use guarantees of origin. Is this something uh, like a niche thing? Is it important? I think it is. Um, these are the most recent statistics. I updated this graphic uh, even this morning. Uh, so this is Q3 2017. You see that the demand for guarantees of origin, uh, or you could say the demand for green electricity by consumers in the countries affiliated uh, to the AIB. So this is only about the X part of Europe, not uh, about uh, countries like Poland, for instance, uh, which are currently not within the AIB membership. You see a very clear growth year after year, quite steep, um, of the demand for geos and therefore the demand for, great, for green electricity uh, in the X area. And very often we also heard the argument used against guarantees of origin, ah, this is not really significant because there is a, a huge oversupply of guarantees of origin available in, in, in Europe or in the X area. Well, if you look at the issuance, so the um, the production of, of guarantees of origin, you see that last year we were just under 400 terawatt hours of electricity within the X area. If I go back to the demand, you see that in 2017, the demand in the first three quarters already uh, exceeded that level. So clearly, the argument of this is a market in huge oversupply is an argument which is no longer valid or 
uh, at least we can say that this market is becoming more and more um, in equilibrium uh, rather than in oversupply, which is, I think, a very good thing. You see, <clears throat> I'm sorry, you see in this graph that the um, sources of guarantees of origin are very diverse. You see that Norway, for instance, in typically a very important or the biggest um, producer of guarantees of origin because they have a lot of hydro. You also see in the 2016 column that, for instance, Spain entered in the system and immediately on this. Okay, let's look at some trends in terms of electricity sourcing by corporate consumers. We see that more and more corporate consumers are getting picky, and I think they are right to be picky. More and more, instead of just buying geos, any geos from any source, from any technology, they are looking for more and more specific kinds of guarantees of origin. They are sometimes asking for locally produced because there is, um, for instance, within the NGO or the consumer uh, organizations, some voices say that in order to um, stimulate local investment in renewables, it is good that people try to use local produced electricity and therefore locally produced guarantees of origin. There is also a big deal about the technological source of the geo. Some um, buyers specifically ask for wind or for solar or for hydro, uh, or some specifically do not want a typical, uh, a, a, a specific technology uh, like hydro. Uh, I hear, hear very few concerns with wind and solar, but I sometimes hear the concern that hydro uh, is not what they want. You can specifically ask for geos which represents production that was not supported by a feed-in tariff or green energy certificates. You can uh, specifically um, call for uh, geos for uh, renewable uh, plants that have been recently built, or you could have a combination of all kinds of uh, requests and the good thing about guarantees of origin because they carry so much information about all of these aspects that I have mentioned here, uh, the geos actually enable the consumer to make choices and it's not a thing that you have to take passively, you can actively request for a certain uh, quality of guarantees of origin. Now. Of course, CO2 is a very important part of this whole thing. I've already mentioned carbon footprinting. As a consumer, if you don't specify which electricity you buy, you typically will just get the grid. And you know the grid average, the grid fuel mix. And typically in Europe, you see that the grid mix is carrying quite a lot of environmental burden. Uh, especially if you look in terms of CO2. Now, these are hypothetical numbers, but if you buy the grid mix, you can think, uh, you have to realize that you are buying electricity uh, where there is quite a lot of carbon um, involved. And if you buy specific types of electricity, like renewables or like nuclear, then you know that there is a much lesser or even zero carbon uh, load attached to the electricity you buy. If you uh, should specifically buy coal-produced uh, electricity, uh, I'm not aware of any geos for coal, but theoretically they could exist, then you would uh, also see on, uh, or through the geo, you could also uh, see the environmental impact of coal. So clearly, um, again, this is an instrument uh, in terms of uh, consumer empowerment because it, it allows the consumer not to have to passively take the grid average in terms of fuel mix, but to make specific choices 
for instance, in terms of environmental effects. So what is the mission of the guarantees of origin? Um, we feel that electricity consumers should be able to choose the power they desire, to trust in the system, and therefore they have to make, they have to be confident and trust that there is no double counting or no greenwashing, we'll come back to that word later, that they can be informed and that they understand how their decision to buy uh, a certain electricity contract influences um, the environment and society, and therefore they can take responsibility for that impact and be accountable. And lastly, for multinational consumers, um, I think there's also uh, the fact that standardization of the guarantee of origin, as AIB is, is doing it, enables the consumers, uh, if they are multinational corporations, to uh, find a familiar uh, way of dealing and a familiar product all over the X area. So the green power market in Europe is actually a very diverse market. Uh, on average, um, I hear that the uh, GO is now traded at something like 30 or 35 cents per GO, therefore uh, 35 cents per megawatt hour of renewable electricity. But you also see that some technologies and in some specific circumstances, the price can be much higher, one, two, three, and in some cases even four euro per geo per megawatt hour. And this is then, for instance, the case for things like solar or um, unsupported wind, stuff like that. So very diverse, again, illustration of the fact that this is not something uh, of a one-size-fits-all uh, one approach. Okay, how is this important for corporate strategies towards sustainability? I think the first thing most companies who want to uh, uh, be green or be sustainable try to do is to invest on site. Um, this is uh, almost a no-brainer. You, you do this, you get a lot of production um, which you don't have to take off the grid, therefore you don't have to pay for, but it is quite complicated. You need financing, you need the physical circumstances, you need to have a roof for solar, you need to have a big uh, area for wind, uh, you have to uh, build a lot of partnerships. So this is not for everyone. Uh, and the second possibility is to go offside with the investment and then a power purchasing agreement, a PPA, is a very good um, alternative, uh, say you find a, a, a developer and this developer is willing to build a wind farm um, close to your plant or not, that depends, but uh, when you pay for it, then you can claim to uh, buy the electricity from those wind turbines for the next 10 or 15 years and clearly you can demonstrate that you are uh, sustainable but then you need the geos because if you don't have the geos from that wind farm, you cannot say that you are using the uh, power coming from your investment. And then the third level, maybe uh, the not so attractive to some, but that's just to say, well, I don't have the possibility to invest myself, I don't have the size of the scale to uh, participate in a PPA, then you can uh, source green electricity and then again you will need the guarantees of origin to claim that you are um, using electricity from renewable sources. So clearly uh, for most of the, uh, especially for not the, the biggest companies, if you want to be sustainable in your energy strategy, you will need to uh, use guarantees of origin somewhere as part of your strategy. So the two basic arguments that we hear against the use of guarantees of origin by corporates or by consumers in general is it's not additional, it's not additional, which means that you are not making a contribution to new investment in production from renewable sources. 
for me, this is a very strange argument. I think if the demand for electricity from renewable sources goes up and goes beyond the supply, and we've, we've just seen the graphs that this is pretty much the situation the market is uh, in uh, these days, then it's basic economics. If there is more demand than supply, then there will be an effect on production. But we have to admit that in the past, it is true that new built renewable production facilities have been 99.9% um, triggered by subsidies, by feed-in tariffs, by green certificates, and not by geos. But this can shift if we go into a situation of uh, over-demand rather than over-supply. And that's why I insist so much on saying that the geo is not homogeneous, it's not generic. You can ask for what you want if you ask for local production, if you ask for a specific technology like wind and solar, or if you ask for a newly built plants, it's much easier to be additional or to prove that you are additional. And the second argument is greenwashing. Now, as I've said, once the electricity is on the grid, you can't tell whether it comes from coal, from gas, from nuclear, or from renewables. And so something like, ah, oh, but you are greenwashing coal power, is actually something very strange to say. You can only buy electricity from the grid, and you can only buy geos, and if you do the two things, then you can say you use green electricity. If you just buy electricity, you're just buying electricity, and you have to accept that there is a grid mix, a fuel mix on the grid. But I do accept one point of this argument, uh, that is that electricity suppliers must inform consumers much more than they do now. Electricity suppliers mostly say, oh, it's green, it's a geo, there's a geo behind it, so it's green, you can trust it. And then you, of course, you create this argument from uh, NGOs and consumer organizations that, yeah, but these geos, these, this is sometimes coming from hydro from 100 years old. And I understand this argument. So if electricity suppliers are more transparent, I think we can get away from this greenwashing argument. And if consumers ask for specific geos, this is also helping to get away from the greenwashing argument. OK, additionality. Let's see what Google has to say. Google identifies in their uh, strategy three scenarios. And they say, if there is this supplier which has one wind farm, it's 10 years old, they haven't built any wind farm, any new wind since then. Well, hmm. there's a second case. Um, there's a wind project. It's not built yet, but they are building it. And uh, if you then buy the electricity from that future wind farm, that's mostly the PPA model. Imagine that there is another company which is building wind farms constantly. Um, if you then buy wind, uh, or electricity from one of those wind farms, would that be additional? Well, what Google says is the first case is not additional. Someone who has some wind turbines but hasn't invested in recent years, that's not a company we want to invest in or, or do business with because that's not additional. If it's a PPA, it's additional because you are building new capacity. And even if it is capacity that exists, but it is in the hands of a company which is building new capacity all the time, then again, we feel that buying that green electricity is sufficiently additional to say that we are contributing and that we are uh, implementing our green strategy. Now, let me give a very short case study on a situation I know here in Belgium. It's the Nike uh, Logistics Center. I'm not going to go into any details, but they have a very clear uh, strategy for sustainable um, uh, energy, uh, and they have quite some energy uh, uh, demands. And uh, I got these slides from the company which is uh, advising them on the strategy, which is Zero Emission Solutions. So uh, this is the plant, uh, and you see that they are developing a new site, and you also see that there is renewable production in the environment with a biogas plant and a hydro plant, which is not owned by Nike, but which is very close. And uh, if you look at their strategy, they aim for 100% renewable energy. 
they produce as much themselves. That's the first level strategy I was telling you about. They have quite big solar and quite some wind turbines on site, but that's not enough to cover everything. So what they do as a second step is they try to buy as much from the uh, production facilities, which are as close by as they can find them. So the hydro, the hydro plant and the biogas plant also um, produce uh, geos, and these geos are used by Nike to claim that they use as much as possible local, um, locally produced uh, renewable electricity, and this is facilitated in the accounts of the Flemish uh, issuing body, uh, Vrij. So I think if you look at what I've heard, for instance, at the resource event uh, last month in Brussels, or what I hear in the Rex Market Meeting, uh, which is one of the yearly conferences for sustainable energy procurement, I hear that uh, geos are recognized by the corporate consumers now as a strategic instrument. They are used on site for claiming the green character of the production, which means that it is used on site so the geos are no longer tradable. It is used in off site PPAs because you need the geo to close the business model. If you can't claim the, to use the electricity from that specific uh, wind farm or whatever solar plant or whatever technology you're using, then the PPA business model is not convincing, and that's why there is so much. Um, a reaction to the proposal to auction guarantees of origin for supported plants because that would kill the business model for PPAs if they rely on a feeding tariff or green certificates. And then there's the more traditional green procurement. It is now more and more understood by buyers. It is um, they are uh, responding to the criticisms by saying no, no, no. We buy the guarantees of origin we feel that are right for us, and we don't buy the ones like biomass, which maybe are under scrutiny from the NGOs. And as I've said, there is a lot of reasons which are being operated now for uh, buying geos, such as carbon footprinting, um, science-based targets, and the greenhouse gas reporting. We're almost there. Let's look at the uh, disclosure part. I think this is an example, again, from uh, Vrech, the Flemish sharing body, of uh, the responsibility that regulators could take in terms of informing the consumers. Um, Vrech has two instruments um, based on uh, fuel mix and, and therefore based on geos where renewable are uh, concerned. The first one is the origin comparator. Uh, this online tool, a consumer can look uh, at the different suppliers and see last year what was their fuel mix, and even on a product level, on a contract level, so product per product, and you see here an example of a supplier which had a 100% green offer, and which countries these geos were coming from. In this case, it was mostly Norwegian, and uh, Italian, very surprising, Italian uh, origin of these uh, guarantees of origin. And then if you go, if you, if you choose as a consumer, you choose a contract with one of these suppliers, you can go to a second instrument, which is the green check, and that looks like this. Um, with this instrument, you, can, you have to give in your uh, connection point identification, and just to, to inform you, this is my personal my house, uh, and you see that I don't only talk about it, but I also make sure that I use 100% green electricity at my home. And this instrument by Frech allows me to check whether the supplier is indeed um, uh, proving by using guarantees of origin that my electricity is uh, green, coming from renewable sources. Um, so to wrap up, I think I've just uh, used two minutes too much, so this is my final slide. Um, what we try to do, uh, or what we do, uh, we don't try, we, we succeed uh, with AIB to make things reliable and transparent. Uh, we facilitate transparency uh, by 
standardization, we uh, can tell the consumer where the electricity is coming from, how it is being produced, or was produced, and when it was produced, if it is about electricity from renewable sources. We standardize, therefore, our members commit to using a unique standard, and therefore, they apply consistent, reliable methodologies, and we constantly peer review our members uh, to ensure that they live up to the standards. And that's uh, why we say that our goal is uh, to have a transparent market in Europe, I should say, I should add, where consumers are empowered uh, by this information and therefore these consumers can take responsibility and if they do that, I'm convinced that you can say that they drive the energy transition towards a more sustainable system. So that's what I wanted to tell you. Uh, these are my coordinates. If you should have any questions you cannot raise uh, at this point uh, during the webinar, please feel free to drop me an email or give me a call. And I think, Hans, uh, I can go back to you and to moderate the question and answer session.